All right. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. I keep saying 1 to 13, but I've never gotten past verse 4, and I'm still not going to. Uh, this was supposed to be a three-week sermon series, and uh, yeah, that, that may not have been true, but uh, we'll see. Next week, I still have to do forgiveness, and I probably need one more sermon on another topic, too, that we'll get to. Okay, Luke chapter 11, starting in verse 1. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. Oh, lead us not into temptation. I got to do like a whole sermon on that too. <laughs> okay. Hopefully I get done this sometime. All right. So here's the big point. Here's the big point. True prayer reforms our desires. And that is the sense of we have a certain amount of desires and True prayer is going to reform them in a way to make them better desires. Now, we don't naturally want the things that are best for us. I, uh, I heard, in, uh, I saw an ad once and it was kind of like, I think it was an ad for maybe like chocolate or something. And it was like, follow your desire. And that might be good advice if you're desiring the right thing. It might be a really bad advice if you're, you know, Adolf Hitler. And they're like, oh, I want to kill all the Jews. This is my, I'm following my heart. And if we, in our unredeemed, in our, in our flesh, just prayed for our desires, we would have almost an anti-Lord's prayer. It's like an anti-Lord's prayer. Blessed be my name. My kingdom come. I mean, how many times have we prayed a prayer kind of like that? My kingdom come. Maybe we, pray, we pray that people, I would be rich. People would serve me. I'd be healthy. That's like praying my kingdom come. My will be done all over the earth. All the health and money I could want. And I will judge those I hate. For mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. That's the anti-Lord's prayer. Now the interesting thing about prayer is that we can only truly pray according to what we actually want, to what we actually desire. Now, the story of Hannah is a great example of this. So Hannah, Hannah is a godly woman. She's going to be the mother of Samuel. And uh, so I, I actually heard a Christian teacher once say that there's not a, nowhere in the Bible is there a silent prayer, but there's actually one. It's a really godly one. And it's the story of Hannah in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if indeed you will look on the affliction of your servant, now she hasn't had any children, she's barren. And remember me and, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son. Then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. No razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart. Only her lips moved and her voice was not heard. Then we're going to get the funny thing about how she, you know, Eli thinks she's drunk, but... Uh, the point is rather simple, is that God hears Hannah's heart. And, and sometimes we can, we can think like we're, we're praying these words out loud and that's what God is looking at. But God, like man looks to the outside, God looks to the heart. And so you can't trick God. You can't say, oh God, I really want your glory and honor, but 
actually like your heart doesn't want that those things like god will heal your heart hear your heart like an atheist if an atheist is saying the lord's prayer holy be your name but he doesn't really believe that like god isn't honored or listening to that prayer in fact you know him speaking contrary to how his heart really desires he's lying to god with god's own prayer which is definitely not honoring to god You know, we, we even understand this. How good does it feel if someone looks into your eyes and tells you, I love you, but you know they're lying? You know they like, like that, it doesn't feel good. And maybe it feels good for a moment, but that is not like going to feel good. And if we could see people how God sees people, see their hearts, it definitely wouldn't be good. Now, the Lord's Prayer shows us what our desires should be. But that immediately leads us to the problem. I just told you we can't pray against our true desires, like not rightly, because God hears our heart just as much as our lips moving. And so... If you don't actually want God's kingdom first, you just want health and prosperity and peace for your family, me teaching you to pray, oh Lord God, my kingdom first, isn't actually going to help you. <laughs> because you can say the words, but if your heart doesn't change, it's not going to make your prayer any more honoring to God or do the things that it should. This reminds me of, uh, you get these funny things in prayer, it reminds me, I had a professor in college and he, he pastored a, a pretty rough church and they had like an open prayer time and so people would share prayer requests and the lady gets up in the back and says, pastor, please pray for me. My boyfriend wants to go back to his wife. Yeah. If there's ever a, you know, Lord God, may your will be done in this situation kind of prayer. How do you teach her to pray? It's like, this is what she desires. And immediately you see her desires need to change before her words change. Because even if she just parrots the words, Lord God, I pray that your will be done. Like she's... Now, prayer, true prayer, is not saying the right words. When I teach, I'm not teaching you to say the right words, but having our desires reformed from the inside out. Now, Paul often describes the Christian life as a war between the flesh and the spirit. Ephesians 4.22, put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. Desires to trick you, desires for things that are not godly, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds. Our old self is corrupt, and it's corrupt because it wants the wrong things. Now, we live in a culture that has a dominant narrative that your desire, your inborn desire, the desire that you, you were born with is the most important thing and to deny that desire or repress that desire, especially in the realm of sexual desire, is the root of all psychological wrong and harm. Now this is a view of humankind that goes back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau it says that a person in their natural state, how they're born, is good, and it's only society and rules that corrupt them. Now, it's interesting that none of these people raise children. <laughs> because if they did, and they saw, like, like, children don't naturally desire what's good for them. They don't, like, they're born and be like, Mommy, I'd like the broccoli. Like, no, they want candy. They want candy. And the same thing, like, we... In our former manner of our old self, according to the flesh, our unredeemed self, 
wants the wrong things. Now, our desires can change. What we want can change. And in some ways, it's really obvious. So there was a time when it really hit people. What they wanted was this phone that had all these buttons on it, had a keyboard. What did we call that thing? A Blackberry. Everybody wanted a Blackberry. All the cool people, they wanted a Blackberry. But now who wants a Blackberry? Nobody wants a Blackberry. Nobody wants a Blackberry. Maybe Hillary Clinton. I don't know. Now everybody wants a shiny new iPhone. Now, the reason why they don't want a BlackBerry anymore, the BlackBerry hasn't changed. It's still the same keyboard with the tactile feels it ever was. But they found out there was something better. And so sometimes when we find something better, our desires can change. This is important in the Christian life. Sometimes, you know, we have some good desires, like the desire for health and comfort and safety, like those are all good desires by themselves. But if we desire a higher purpose, like God's kingdom, like we might forsake those things for the higher good because we've discovered something even better. And that's why Christians can even sometimes go to their deaths following Christ, counting everything is lost, knowing that Jesus Christ is better than any of these things. So the higher desire replaces the lesser desire. Second, our desires can change by faith. And this is a little mysterious, but this is... So Abraham set out by faith to a country that he didn't know. Now he trusted God's promise. He didn't really have the the knowledge of what he was going to get, but he trusted God and said, you know, this thing, you don't know what it is yet, but it's going to be good. And so we trusted God to take a step forward in that direction towards that thing so that when he got it, when he got there, the desire could become complete and reformed and different. Now in this way, when we learn about prayer, when God teaches us to desire different things, we have to kind of do it by faith because naturally in our old self, we don't desire God's kingdom above other things. We don't desire God's holiness above other things. But by faith, you need to say, God, like, like, try it out. Take a step in that direction by faith. And when you get there, you might be surprised. And the third thing we need to consider with desire is that we will have, until the day that we desire, competing, day that we die, competing desires in our heart. So when we get down to pray, like we're going to want God's glory and God's kingdom as his, as his spirit is working in us to change us day by day. But we're also still going to want some of the things of the flesh. And these things are going to kind of duke it out in our hearts. Which is why Paul says, put off your old self. And this is the kind of thing we're going to have to be like kind of putting off the des- desires for the wrong and putting on the spirit to desire the highest good. And hopefully some, like my, my garden and the, the peas, the godly desires will shade out the weeds. So, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us a hierarchy of what our desires should be. What our highest desires should be, and there are other desires that we should desire in prayer. And so this gives a, a model and a hierarchy of what things we should pray for first. And we already learned, first thing we should desire in prayer is God's holiness, even God himself. And so we come to God as our Father. We desire Him above anything else. And so we come to Him and just enjoy Him for who He is, praising His name for who He has been from all eternity. It's, it's, it's amazing. This, it's so funny. I, this week, I, I really made an effort. Like, I'm just going to, like, pray for God's holiness. I'm going to enjoy God in prayer. And it was, it was so sweet praying. Like, it's amazing. That guy on Sunday knew what he was talking about. Uh, it's like it's amazing like i'm surprised that i did what i said in the sermon and it was like really meaningful like i shouldn't have been surprised it was in god's word but anyways 
It's like, it's so sweet to, to, to seek God's holiness. And so, you know, you step out in faith, you focus on this, and man, man that is a great thing to desire. And then all of a sudden you build a taste for it, kind of like, you know, sometimes with vegetables. Still working on that. Our second desire should be for God's kingdom. And so the prayer is, Father, hallowed be thy name, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. And this we have to talk about a little bit. So there's going to be a, a, a bit of teaching here. Because your kingdom come is, is a, a, a big prayer. Because in the Bible when it talks about the kingdom, it's talking about a lot of things. And I think it really encompasses all of this. And so as we reform our desires to be God's desires, we pray for the best things and the best thing is God and the second best thing is what God is doing in the world and what God is doing in the world is his kingdom so there's four aspects of this and the first is future kingdom when we pray your kingdom come the most pertinent part is for Jesus to come quickly you know, the Bible ends with a prayer Revelation 22, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And that's a prayer. And so we see a bombing on the news, we see COVID, we see all of these things in the world. We turn and we say, Lord, come quickly, set us free from this body of death, Re rescue this world of sin. And so we pray, Lord, come quickly quickly now we need reformed desires in this because sometimes we don't always want God to come quickly I can remember for a couple like six months before I got married and I was really excited about some things about being married and I was just like well no Lord I hope you don't come in the next six months now that's a wicked thing to pray like like I had bad desires now it was good it was, it was a good desire but it wasn't the best desire and so we want God to be Reforming our desires, so we desire his kingdom above simple pleasures. Second, oh, I'm still on here. The church. So the kingdom is in his church. The kingdom isn't just a future reality, and we see this in a bunch of places. But Luke 17, and we'll talk about it more when we get there. Uh, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. And we see the kingdom of God in the people of God, the body of Christ, not like the institutional church of Rome, we're going to like claim lands for the church, like that's not the church. The church is the invisible people of God who worship him together. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, we are praying for people's eyes to be open to the glory of Jesus Christ so that they are saved here. And remember, this is our topic. So, so when we pray, we want to be praying for the church to be built up as people come to faith. We want to pray for evangelism. This is all under this heading. We want, we want to pray for Jennifer Obelman going out in Belarus. And I really love what Madonna's done with the uh, bulletins now. And this is something I think we might lean into a little bit, having our bulletins as prayer guides. So you can take your bulletin home. You can pray for these provinces in Belarus. You can be praying with all the saints that people would open your eyes. Lord, your kingdom come there. We pray your kingdom come. We pray for our own church. That our church would be built up. That our youth would be strengthened. That we would be built up as a, a church to be doing the things that we should. We're praying for other churches. You know, we, I prayed in our prayer. Like, you know, Victory Church. We pray for all of the churches in our town that God would be glorified in them and that God's kingdom would come next we pray kingdom come we pray in our hearts Romans 14 17 the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit and this is the idea of the kingdom of God coming like right here in our hearts as we follow him more and so we pray your kingdom come. We're praying for his kingdom come like right in our hearts so that we're putting off the old desires, we're putting off sin, and that we are seeking God more and more day by day. And so our prayers should be saturated with, Lord, make me more like you. 
Make my family more like you. And lastly, in the world, and this one's a little bit different. We don't often think about it, but when the Bible teaches us to pray for leaders, that things will be peaceable and things will be good, part of praying for God's kingdom to come is praying for justice even in, in our own land. It's praying for Scott Moe, praying for Justin Trudeau, praying that they would protect the weak, give justice to the rich and poor alike, so that we live in a just land, that the laws of our land resemble more God's laws. Now, we still pray, Lord, come deliver us from this dying world. But we still pray for peace for everyone, even apart from them coming to Christ, although we pray for that first. So, we get to the final petition in the Lord's Prayer in Luke, which is, give us each day our daily bread. And as the series has gone, we've talked a lot about you're praying for God's glory. And we're, today, we're mostly talking about praying for, for the church to be built up and all the ways that that happens and the kingdom to come. But even so, Jesus teaches us that not only can we pray for our daily needs, but we must pray for them. And he does it in a very particular way. He says, give us each day our daily bread. And you think maybe he would just say, you know, Lord, meet our needs. Or something like that. But by saying it this way, it uh, teaches us two very important things. And one, Jesus says to pray, give us each day our daily bread and not asking for bread for forever things for forever it teaches us that just as jesus says don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will take care of itself just as he says that he teaches us when we pray pray for what you need right now and leave tomorrow for god so even when you get down to god in prayer you're not in anxiety about what's going to happen tomorrow you're saying, Lord, feed me for today. I trust you for tomorrow. Just like the Israelites in the wilderness, they went to bed every night with cupboards bare, having to trust God that manna would show up on the ground tomorrow, except on before the Sabbath. Then they got two days. We can go to bed every night knowing God, we are in God's hands and it's a good place to be. And secondly, Jesus teaches us to pray our daily bread. And so as we pray for our needs, we pray for our most basic needs. And I think this should really guide our prayers because as our desires often upon in the world can be very fleshly and be very greedy. And we're warned about greed, 1 Timothy 6, 8. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire, again the word desire, to be rich fall into temptation and so by teaching us to pray our daily bread jesus is warning about praying greedy prayers about praying for more than we need lord god give me just what i need today and i will be content and as he says pray daily bread this teaches us day by day to trust in god's providence to provide for us and not in how hard we can work. I don't know about you, but I often want to like, I want to work hard, get everything done. But no, I am first going to ask God for this. And then even as I work, what I get is given to me by God. And everything's given to me by God anyways. True prayer reforms our desires. And in this way, as we pray the Lord's Prayer, all of these natural fleshly desires, they get knocked down, put away. And so instead, we get a new hierarchy. Because naturally, if we just, somebody start, becomes a Christian, they start praying, you know, what do they pray? They pray, Lord God, keep me safe. Help me to get from one place to another. I know we used, I, I used to joke about this. I gave this rant in my old church. We used to have prayer time, like we would have like a prayer requests. Prayer and share, prayer and share. And 95% of the prayer requests either were because of someone's health 
or someone traveling from one place to another. Now, those things are fine to pray for, and they're good, and we should. But if that is all our prayer, like, we are missing a lot of important things. And so I would give this rant about how we should be praying for, like, God's kingdom and stuff. And then prayer and chair time would be, like, silent. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, this isn't working quite how I planned. But anyways. Yeah, yeah, praises, which is, which is great, too. We haven't gotten the Thanksgiving, which we will get to. So now we see a kind of hierarchy to our prayer life. And when we think about our prayers, we should think about it like this. So the big, the big bar chart is going to be God's holiness, then the kingdom of God, and then our basic needs and the needs of our family and those we love. First, we have God's himself in heaven, and our desire is his name would be praise, and we pray, Lord God, we praise you. You are great and good and holy, and we find our deepest joy in you. Second, we pray for God's kingdom to come, that Jesus would come in the future. Oh, Lord God, come quickly. Check the sky. We pray, Lord God, in the church that we would be built up here and in China across the world, we would be strong, Lord God, and built up that our neighbors would know Christ, that we would all praise you with unity in one voice. Lord God, we pray that your kingdom would come in our hearts, that we would know you deeper and more, and we would rejoice more, Lord God. And even, you know, as we're praying, Lord God, your kingdom to come. Lord God, I pray that you would change my desires and make this my purest desire, that I would put your kingdom first. And all these things trust to be added to me. We pray for the kingdom in the world. Oh, Lord, we pray for Scott Moe and Justin Trudeau that justice will be done, the unborn would be protected, and there would be peace in our land. And finally, we should pray for our needs. Lord God, give to me what I need today so that even the soup that we put on the stove is blessed and sanctified in your name and we receive it as we receive it from your hand. Now, prayer like this might be a little bit like vegetables to us. Like it's not something we just naturally like pick up, like we want to pray for God's kingdom. It doesn't come like instantaneously to us. And yet, on the day you get the news of your heart attack, you don't say, boy, I'm sure glad I ate all those potato chips which apparently aren't a vegetable, according to my wife. <laughs> Even though they're potatoes. I don't get how that works. Someday, you will meet God. And all of those prayers for health and for your job and for all of those are going to seem really, really small. And you will not regret any prayer for God's holiness and glory and that you would see his face. And so that that day is a joy to you. Because at that point, your deepest desire will be met. Because as the Lord's Prayer reforms our desires, God becomes our deepest desire. And we will find it in him on that day. Amen. Let's call up the worship team. Lead us. Worshiping God.